Hello everyone. So in this lecture, uh, we will look at uh, the compile flow. Uh, the flow which is uh, compile is a command in you know, Ren compiler that actually carries out synthesis. We will look at uh, what this compile command does. Uh, we will look at a few strategies of uh, doing synthesis. Uh, we will look uh, at some of the options of compile uh, command. So, uh, let us uh, go through the flow again. Uh, so, we uh, looked at in the last lecture we looked at how to set the design constraints. Uh, so, we were looking at this part uh, we saw design rule constraints max function max fan out max capital. Then we uh, so, how to constrain the design happening <laughs> that is how to define a clock. So, just to review uh, the tool will break down all the timing uh, paths into path groups. So, that the timing path groups are register to register paths which are constrained by just defining the clock. There are input registers paths, register paths which uh, need set input delay to properly constrain. And again, register to output paths, uh, we need to set output delay. There is a set max area constraint uh, to set area goals. So, uh, till this point, before uh, selecting the compile strategy, we have looked how to specify the boundary condition. First, how to how to set the library, read the RTL, set the operating conditions, while load model, etc., set design constraints. So, before this point, we have not actually performed any synthesis. We are just setting our tool, setting up the constraint, setting up all the desiring operating conditions before the synthesis even goes ahead. Now, the first step of doing synthesis, I mean, after all this is done, after we have gone through the constraints part, the first step is uh, we should know. What strategy the strategy we want to follow? So uh, I talk about the top down and bottom up in more detail in the coming slide. Then <laughs> we'll go ahead and synthesize the design. The last part is uh, what we'll look in the uh, in the next sector is uh, how to check, how to report. So now now the synthesis is done. Now there's a lot of checking we need to do to make sure that synthesis is perfect. We need to check the area report, we need to check the resource user uses report, we need to check the constraints, whether they are the goals are being met or not. So in the next lecture we will concentrate on the uh, analyzing and resolving the known problem, how to report timing, how to report area and so on. So let us let us focus on the compile in this lecture. So the uh, optimization process DC performs is divided it is it, it, at three levels. So, DC will does with DC will do optimization at three levels starting right from the RTM. So, first uh, level is called architecture optimization, second is called logic level optimization, third is called gate level optimization. And then let us look at each of them in a bit detail with more detail. So, the first the architecture optimization works directly on the SDL display. It will include uh, a lot of high level synthesis tasks such as sharing, resource sharing, so sharing common sub expressions and resource sharing. These two will result into lower area obviously because let us say you have multiple adders in your design, in your RTL description. Now, uh, just by looking at a plus sign, DC will know that this will translate into an adder. This is irrespective of any technology that we use. The things have not gone to the technology level yet, we are still working at technology independent that is at the GTEC level still. So, but even at the GTEC GTEC level, PC knows that you are using different types of adders, maybe a full adder or a half adder, and then it will try to find out whether these adders can be shared across expressions or not. So, this is what it does. In this, these first two steps, we will see if it if it can share common sub expression. 
if it can share resources, resources can be data paths like the adders, method plans, and so on. It will also uh, make decisions about what designer components, what designer implementations to pick up. For example, for an adder, there are multiple implementations like a ripple adder, a carry look adder, and so on. So it will do some sort of implementation selection. So when when we when we say implementation, implementation means the design where component would be an adder, and the implementation can be one of ripple, carry look ahead, carry save, and so on. Reordering of operations uh, to make sure that the area is, is minimal. Identifying arithmetic expression for data path synthesis. Now, few of these things like selecting design and implementation and identifying arithmetic expression for data path synthesis, these options are. Available only in DC Ultra. What it means is that there are two commands for synthesis. One is compile, which is the basic compile command. Other is the compile underscore ultra command. Compile underscore ultra command is part of the license, which is called DC Ultra. I am not very sure whether it is available for you in the labs. Even if it is not available, it is not a big problem. Most of the trial designs that we look most of the simple designs that we look are uh, the, the compile command is good enough for those. So earlier, uh, a few years back, there used to be a separate uh, feature of design compiler, which used to help us in doing data path synthesis. Data path means uh, a design which is heavily using arithmetic operations, like an arithmetic logic unit of a CPU. That is adders, multipliers, subtractors, and so on. So uh, DC had a separate feature which was helpful in optimizing this part of the design uh, effectively. Now those all those features are now brought into they are available in Compile Ultra. So Compile does a good job. Compile Ultra does an excellent job on the data path operation. So few of these features are not available in Compile. They are available in Compile Ultra. So except for design and implementation, all these tasks occur only during the optimization of an unmapped design. This is the important part here, unmapped design. What unmapped means is that still at this level, DC has not started selecting the technology that we said yet. We are working still at the GTEC level. The mapping has not occurred. So design a netlist that consists of GTEC part is called unmapped netlist. A netlist that is mapped into is, is select has already selected the technology library standard set is called a mapped netlist. So all of these optimizations still work at the unmapped level. However, DC might do some changes to the design implementation even at the gate level stage, even at the map netlist stage. Apart from those, all these steps, all these optimization processes run at the GTEC stage. High level synthesis uh, tasks are based on the constraints and SDL coding style. We have seen that we can force uh, resource sharing, how we can force resource sharing at the RTL stage itself. Um, obviously, our constraints will determine what design or implementation is selected. For example, if uh, we have a very relaxed set of constraints, very slow clock, then DC will use ripple adders because they are lower in area, but they are again slow. If let's say our constraints are very aggressive, then DC will not use ripple adders, it will use some uh, some other type of adders like carry look at or carry save that are better in performance and so on. So after this high level optimization takes place, uh, the netlist we get is the GTEC netlist. Second level of optimization is the logic level optimization. Again, uh, this also works on the GTEC net, GTEC netlist. Now it consists of the two processes. Let's look in the reverse order. Let's look at the flattening first. In flattening, what DC will do? It will pick up a pick up a combinational search, pick up a combination design, and it will. Represent it using a two level sum of product expression. So, if you uh, 
go back to your boolean algebra uh, any function uh, can be represented in sum of products form right what when i say sum of product forms i mean the unreduced sum of products so for example uh, uh, let's say you have a function which has three input a b and c and uh, you have a, so, so a three three input function will have eight states and that function uh, let's say for five of these those states uh, so that total in, in total eight states ranging from 0 0 0 to 1 1 1 and out of those five five states the output is one now the sum of expression will now contain the unreduced the, the unreduced sum of expression will now contain five five expressions for example it will have a b c plus a complement b complement c plus something like that right now you could further use boolean algebra to reduce this but what dc does is it will use during the flattening process it will use the two level sum of product expression without the reduce without reducing it what it does this is carried out independently of constraint and it is very useful for speed optimization for high performance purposes why because there are just two levels of logic between input and output although the area is more so for timing critical parts where you have such combination expression dc will use this process to make sure that there are minimal levels of logic between input and output so that the speed is of a primary importance here and the area is more corresponding now as opposed to flattening dc will use structuring now to reduce this sum of products into something which is more optimized based on the area so the process of structuring will add intermediate variables so when we reduce the sum of product expression we get intermediate variables and logic structures so it will add those intermediate variables which can result into reduced design algebra structuring is again constraint based so now see flattening is is independent of constraint and structuring is constraint based why because dc will only do the structuring for the parts of the design that are not timing critical for the parts of the design dc feels that if dc knows that okay i can reduce the area without affecting the timing it will do it so if you notice uh, the major part of the design will be structured it will not be flattened why because for almost all the designs majority of the timing parts are not non critical there are few set there are few uh, let's say 5% of the parts will be timing critical 95% will not be timing critical all the 95% will get the advantage of structuring so during this process dc will search for sub functions that can be factored out it will evaluate those factors based on the size of the factor the number of times the factor appears so it will factor out the expression it will also see whether these expressions these factoring these factors can be reused so this will dc will turn the sub function that more reduce the logic into intermediate variables and it will factor them out although the language here is, is a bit complex but the process is exactly same as the one you used to reduce the expressions using boolean arithmetic on paper let's look at the third stage of optimization which is called the gate level optimization now gate level optimization works on the gate network to produce a technology specific network now why does a so dc already optimize a lot of stuff in people now when it goes to take, when it goes to picking up the uh, cell now it it will do some kind of optimization depending on what kind of technology that is going to be so first of all it will just try and map stuff so it will map all sequential logic in the plot it will map and gates and gates or gates not gates and so on 
from the cells from it, it will pick up cells from the target library then it will go on to do delay optimization the the goal here is to fix the separation and this part does not fix design rules next it will come to design rule fixing now here dc will try and fix all the design rules even if it sees a timing violation so what it means is that although the design rule fixing as a as an optimization step comes after delay optimization but as we have looked uh, we saw in the earlier lecture design rule fixing takes a higher priority dc will try and fix all the design rules even if it means violating the timing constraint the last of the goal is the area goal it is to make sure that the area is met is met after all these steps have gone through but there will be a step called area recovery where uh, on on a on a design which is already already designed rules are fixed let's say already meet timing goals dc will try and recover area but in the process of area recovery it will not violate either design rule or delay optimization rule so this is just this just we states the priority of optimization that dc is doing now uh, so we saw different levels of optimization now let's see uh, what are the different compile strategies available to us so there are three uh, there are two basic compile strategies one is called the top down compile second is called the bottom up compile and one could use a mixture of both of these which is actually used mostly in industry it's called the mixed compile top down compile as the name suggests uh, starts from a top level design uh, so all the parts of the design all the different atm files are read in and we come there's only one compile chain here dc will attempt to compile attempt to synthesize complete design in one go the bottom up compile again uh, makes use of divide and conquer approach where it's up to us uh, to choose what designs we want what sub designs we want to compile first and then we will uh, use these compiled designs and do a top and do a top level compile so mix compile again uh, uses both of the features of both the strategies let's see in detail we will see few com few compile scripts also so let's take one example of a design where so your design is called top this is the top level rtl file top dot v it contains two uh, instances uh, u1 is an instance of design u u2 is an instance of design v design v in turn contains instance u3 module c instance u4 module d instance u5 module e operating condition we have selected worst case uh, which is expected we, we have selected a wired model to be processed we are targeting a clock frequency of 14 megahertz so here uh, let's not be concerned to concerned about what the input output cores of this design are assume there is a clock assume there are a number of inputs and a number of outputs so for all inputs we are targeting an input delay time of 3 milliseconds we are targeting an output delay time of 2 minutes we are targeting an input drive strength so uh, now please note input drive strength and output load are random conditions and are parallel parallel and operating conditions input drive strength we are targeting there is a cell called buffer called iv we are targeting that all inputs should be driven by we are assuming that all inputs should be driven by this buffer iv we are targeting to synthesize for an output load of 1.5 power now the first step is to develop the environment constraints and the so for at first we will start and develop the constraints for the top level design let's look at the top down compile first so we are assuming that all these rtl files are written at the same time and the compile command is issued at the top level so we will set the current current design to the top and issue a compile command before that we need to make sure that we read libraries correctly we set the environment constraints and the design constraint which is defined by these specifications so let's look at the script 
so the the first two commands first command sets the operating condition second command sets the while loop model we set the driving cell to be this buffer iv which is written in the specification all inputs uh, so design compiler prime time all such tools use tcl language as their base so uh, all the commands here all the uh, expressions here will uh, art article expression so if you uh, do not know tickle at present you will learn during this course you will learn how to use uh, as and when you practice uh, working on design compiler and prime time uh, you will uh, come to know of the various expressions to use various commands in in tickle uh, i would suggest reading some basic material of tickle uh, before attending the labs it will make the understanding a bit easier so first to set the operating condition and while loop model the last to set the driving cell Uh, let's uh, not look at the set right for now. Uh, this one will set the load for all outputs. So all inputs and all outputs are collections. So when we use this uh, with square brace, this collection will return an array of a collection of all the inputs, all the input ports of the design. Similarly, all outputs uh, will return a collection of all the output ports of the design. So uh, these. Uh, the ones marked in blue are the environment conditions we said the environment conditions we said the operating condition while load input conditions that is driving cell and the output cell. the last one set drive zero uh, uh, okay let's look at the create then, then we come to the timing constraint since the target frequency is 40 megahertz we create a clock uh, we create a clock of uh, 25 ns period So period is 25 nanoseconds here. The, uh, one one can ask uh, that how do we define the units? I'll just uh, go back to the library slides and see that the units are defined in the library itself. So usually it's nanoseconds. So period is 25 nanoseconds. The port, the input port is clock here. So assuming there's an input port called CLK, uh, a clock CLK is created at that port. We said the input delay to be three, as written in the specification. Input delay is always with respect to some clock. Here, there is only one clock. Yes. Now, here, uh, this line tells the DC that I want to set this input delay on all inputs except clock, except the input CLK. It does not make sense since CLK is the point where we create a clock. It is not correct to set an input delay there, and CLK is also an input port. So the command all inputs will return a collection of all inputs. Remove from collection will remove the port clock. It will remove the port clock from the collection all inputs. So uh, this is how we. So this is a very standard sort of command to apply input delays. if you want to have a single input delay for all the inputs you must be careful to remove the port on which you are creating the clock from this list set output delay is simple again set output delay of 2 again with respect to the clock clk on all the outputs so this is the constraint file in which we have defined all the environment conditions plus all the timing constraints now usually it's a uh, It's advisable not to do any design rule fixing on the clock. Why? Because clock usually fans out to almost all the resistors in the design. Right? So let's say you have a single clock and you have a thousand resistors, thousand clocks. So this uh, this port clock will be driving. It will have a fan out of thousand. So it will have a big design rule violation. A port which is driving a thousand cells. But design compiler is not the tool. to fix those usually this fixing happens during physical design when an actual clock tree is built that is why we we uh, should make sure that dc should not fix anything on the clock network 
This command tells DC to do exactly that. It is telling DC that the drive is zero on the clock. That means the clock port has an infinite drive strength. So please do not pick this. In the newer versions of the design compiler, there is no need to give this command. There is no need. You can choose to ignore this. A create clock command itself will imply that DC will not touch the port which has a clock defined on it. So such type of networks, the clock network, the reset network, which have high fan out, and which we know that a tree would be built in physical design, high fan out tree it is called. We want to exclude such nets from design rule fixing, and these nets are called ideal network. So you could use a command called, called set ideal network on on these nets. As and when you work on the designs, you will know on these things. Uh, uh, so there's a command called set ideal network which you can use to specify such nets. But uh, please remember, for the newer versions of design compiler, it is not needed to explicitly set an ideal network or a set drive on a clock network. DC, as soon as you give create clock, DC will assume it's an ideal network. Right. So this is the command file which will tell DC what are the environment conditions and what are the timing conditions. Now look, look at the let's look at the process of top down compile. Top down compile is very very simple. It's just one compile command. The flow is you read in the entire design, read in the entire design, apply the constraints and compile the design. There is however one negative one. If the design is big and memory and CPU intensive, it will take a large amount of time for DC to compile. In my experience, I have seen few blocks that are so big and so complex that if we perform a top level compile on those, it takes multiple days for the compile command to run. Now, you do not want that because even if you have a small problem to fix and the design takes let's say a day to, day to compile, then if I issue a command now, I will know only tomorrow what the problem is. So you will waste a lot of amount, lot of um, large amount of time in debugging such kind of design. So it is not desirable to have too large a design go through top down compile. However, in your labs and all, uh, ideally you would use top down compile because it is very very simple compared to the uh, we'll see the bottom bottom of a board which is slightly more complex. It is very simple. You don't have to worry about interlock dependencies. So at, Let's say uh, a design like this. You don't have to worry about the interface between U1 and U2. How to constrain this? Because the compile is happening from the top level. So uh, in your uh, in your labs, you would mostly do a top-down compile. But uh, if you get time, uh, then you should try a bottom-up compile at least once, just to understand the flow. So let's look at top-down compile script. Uh, Read in the design, read in all the all the world of files. It's a good practice to have one module per file, which is being followed here. So module A is into A dot E, module B is into B dot E. So we read all the world of files. We read the top dot B. Please note this script is using read world law. You could use analyze elaborate. I would suggest using analyze elaborate. Uh, that's the recommendation because uh, it gives a much more uh, uh, the analyze elaborate combination will give much more insight into the design exploration, right? So you can view all the warnings easily and so on. It sets the current design to top and performs a link command. Now, what link command does? This command will uh, try and see if there is any type of logic in your design for which. It does not find a module level description. For example, if you forgot to read in design e dot p, then the link command will tell you that there is an instance of some module e for which it is not able to find the description. So link is the one that actually uh, will tell you if you have any module description missing. Right? Assuming you read uh, read in all the files correctly, you source the constraint file. So this defaults.con is nothing but this file we are talking about. 
So, and assume that the libraries and all are correctly set up in the in the dot master DC setup. So, as soon as we invoke DC, the search path and link path are already set. We read in the design. We set the current design to be top. We link the design to make sure that it elaborates perfectly. We source the constraint file. Now we do a compile. We can do compile instead of compile ultra. So we what we did is we just followed this flow. The libraries are part of source dot uh, setup. That is the link library and target library is set up correctly. We read in the design. We define the design environment. We set the design constraints, and now we are applying the compile. We selected the compile strategy to be top down. Now we are using either compile or compile. So we use uh, compile or compile ultra. This will compile the design. So as you see, the top down approach is very very simple. You can just take the flow chart. You should just know the commands. So actually, you can use this script, this complete script, as the starting point. So you can, from the slides, you can copy the script and use it. To make your own top-down compile script for your own design, you have to just replace read the log here by let's say analyze command for all your RTL. Set the current design to be top, <laughs> elaborate the design, and do whatever you want to do. Now let's look at the bottom-up compile. Uh, the bottom-up compile is used for big designs where you do not want to <laughs> compile the design. In one go, because it takes a lot of amount of time and memory. The advantages are clear that it will uh, you can use divide and conquer approach. It requires less memory than the top down compile. It allows time budgeting. Uh, I would say this is uh, an advantage as well as, as well as disadvantage because time budgeting itself requires some effort. We'll see what time budgeting is. The bottom up compile, though, on the other hand. It might need multiple iterations to get it to work. Why we will see. So in the bottom of strategy, it needs manual revision control. The revision control uh, here is in the context of that you have to make sure that um, since you have different iterations, so for each of the iteration, you have to store the uh, constraint file. You have to make sure that there is that there is some kind of revision control in process so that you know what. Changes from one release to another. So uh, the idea is in bottom up that first we choose lower levels, the, the smaller designs, the smaller sub designs, and compile them. Then we read this compiled design as part of the top level design, and now we compile the top level design. And applying the top level constraints, and we check for violations. Now the effort from from design compiler's point of view is reduced because inside your top level design, all the sub designs are already compiled. They are pre-compiled. So what it's doing at the top level is just compiling the glue logic. It's just synthesizing the glue logic. So it's the effort is reduced. Now it is possible that doing this after you, you uh, compile the top level, you see that there are no design violations, so everything is fine. This is uh, the most desirable outcome, but usually it will not happen for for complex designs or for for designs with high performance. It won't happen. So you have to go and perform one more iteration at least to make sure that the violations are. How to do that? Let's see. So the first, the first part of the flow is we have to develop. So any design that goes through compile or synthesis. So compile and synthesis are two terms. I'll keep on using interchangeably. So any block which synthesizes must have a constraint file. Everybody should agree with this, right? Because without the constraint file, there are no goals. Without the goals. The synthesis does not make sense. So when we, so we have to develop both a default constraint file for the top level and a sub design specific constraint. File. So the default constraint file here 
will include the global constraints such as clock information in drive and load estimates that means it will contain all the environment conditions. The sub design specific constraint file now they will reflect the time budgeting. For example, let us look at this figure in there. Now here I want to if I want to do a bottom up complete bottom up I have to compile A, C, D and E separately. So when I compile for example when I compile the, the design C I know the clock assuming that the same clock comes here so assume there is a port called CLK, CLK now this CLK will go to will go to C it will go to D it will go to E it will go to A. The clock is okay is the simpler part but now C will have some inputs it will have some output it will have some inputs coming from let us say A or it has some output going to B or, or vice versa. Now we need to find the input delay and output delay for these ports. Now input delay of 3 and 2 input and output delay of 3 and 2 at the top level do not mean that same values will apply at C because we do not know what C's interface to B or to A or to any other block is really is right. So we have to study we have to know what C does actually and we have to allocate some time budget for the input and output ports of C. This is called time budgeting. So let us say there is an, there's an interface between C and D. Now we have to see what let us say uh, it it is uh, so there is a register in C which drives a register in D and there is some combination logic in between distributed between C and D. Now we have to know what part of the combination logic is in C and what part of this combination logic is in D. And according to that, we will do some kind of time budgeting. We will define, define input and output. Delay. Now, obviously, this is not an easy thing to do for a big design, which has a lot of sub design. So, what we do is at first we start with some growth estimates. So, for this exercise, let us assume that this input and output delay are applicable for each of the sub design. So, we will use these values for each of for every design here. Just to make us make things simpler. So uh, <laughs> we compile the subdesigns. So this is the way we will form the subdesign constraints. We'll compile the subdesign independently. Then we'll read the top level design. And any compiled subdesigns not already in memory. Uh, this is just to say that because we use remove design commands a lot in this process. So we have to make sure that all the designs are read. Before the top level design is read, we will set the current design to top level. We have to link and apply the top level constraints. If the design meets its constraints, we are done. What if it does not? Then comes the second iteration. Now we apply a command called characterize to the cell instance with the worst volume. So now, let us say if we do not meet the timing constraint, we find out what is the cell with worst volume and we apply the characterize command. Characterize command now. So the first iteration has already taken place. Design compiler has all the memory, all the designs in the memory. It knows the interface between all the sub designs. So now the characterize command will enable DC to extract the input output delay, for example, for each of the sub designs. And we can use the write script command to write these values. So write script when we write out a script using characterize command DC will write out let us say I write out a uh, for design C I write out a script command I say write script for this design after issuing the characterize command. So what DC will do it will write out the input delay output delay clock information while load model operating condition and so on the input driving conditions the output load conditions because DC has the information about each of these so it will write out all the constraint the complete constraint file for us. Now in the second iteration we have to use this constraint file and we synthesize it. Why because the first constraint file that we formed was just an extension. 
the second iteration has much more accurate values and it will mostly result into a better synthesized netlist. So, we use this script, uh, we read in the, the, the remove design on line, so I'll just tell that we need to remove all the previous design, which is logical. Again, we read in the RTL design, so we, we have to recompile some RTL code. It will result into a better optimization. We set the current design to this characterized health sub design and recompile using the saved script of the characterization data. We have to do this for all the sub designs that fail timing, right? This is the script. So it again uses a tickle uh, construct, so they are not too difficult to understand, they are much like uh, Perl or somewhat like C. So here we saw there are five designs A, B, C, D, E. Now the idea is this is the comment. The idea is to compile. This is the first iteration. We are compiling each sub block independently. This is a for each which will run through all this block. This, this is a for uh, this is a for loop. Uh, nothing different than a for loop. So for each block in all block, we read in the block source. So we set the variable block source. We read this file. We set the current design to this block. We link, we store the default constraints because as I told you before, we are using the same set of constraints to start with. So whatever the constraints have a top level, we are using for each of the sub -design. So input output delays remain same, the clock remains same. This is the first estimate. So we source this block constraint, uh, block script. So there, there can be a separate uh, block level constraints which you can form for sub design. You could, you could read them here. So we read the default constraints and we read the sub design specific constraints you might have here and then we do a compile. So this whole construct here, this complete construct here is doing the first iteration. That is, it is compiling all these small sub designs. Now we go ahead and read the top level design, set the current design to the top, we link and we write. We write out the first part. Now, why did not we use a compile command here? It is assuming that top level does not contain any blue The top level is just a structural format. That means the top level is nothing but it contains the module instances and wires, which is a very good assumption. The idea is that there should not be any blue at the top. So, the compile effort is saved. There is no need to compile anything at the top level because all the sub designs are already compiled. The write command will write out a DTC for the DTC is a binary format. You can also write a regular format. So we write out the first pass DTC. Now we apply the constraints at the top level, the top level constraints, and we check the timing. This is for checking the volitions. So what this this part is doing, this first slide is doing. It is compiling all the sub designs. It is reading the top level, and it is applying the top level constraint. Now, applying the top level constraint do not mean you have to go through this interface. Why? Because the top level the design is already compiled. It is available in network format. We just want to check. The only thing we want to do here, this here, is we just want to check if the top level design meets time. So we check for timing volitions. If there are no timing volitions, done. We are good. But what if there are timing volitions? This is the second part of the script. So now we we select all instances and we use a characterize command. We then we see that characterize all these instances for you. Yeah. So now for each of the blocks. We so this, this for each of the blocks, we set the uh, the current design and we write this one. This write step will only work after characterization done, and characterize may take some time. We are telling DC that characterize all these instances. That means find out what the constraints are for each of these instances. What are the environment conditions for each of these instances? 
this we will do that and then for each of the block we write out this way. Now what we have to do? We have to do a second pass compile. Now for each of the block we clear memory, we read in the well log, we read in the well log here, we read the we set the current design to be this block, we apply the default constraints. Now these default constraints are not timing constraints in this, in this case they are simply we are setting the uh, operating condition and we are setting the variable mode. We are not setting the input output today. Now we read the this. Now we read the script that is written out by me after first pass. We are sourcing it here. Yeah. It is very suitable. There might be any block level specific constraints. We can we will see in unit five what they could be. Unit four and five. These these might be some timing exception something like that. We source it here and then we compile this block again. So this is the second pass. So the first pass was with estimated constraints. The second pass is with characterized constraints. Now uh, the the last part of it is exactly same as this. We will read the top level design. We will link. We will source the top level constraints and we will check time. We will check for volition. So we see that a bottom up is comparatively a bit more complex than the top top down approach. So my recommendation if you can do top down if it is well within the limits of the CPU time and the memory usage please go ahead do not even think about doing bottom up. Top down is much better in terms of uh, area and timing optimization if the design is not large not too large. So in fact uh, we do chip level like this. Let us say our chip has multiple blocks, let us say one is USB, other is let us say a CPU, third block can be an impact decoder. So, what we do is a USB, a CPU, and an impact decoder individually are very, very big blocks. We cannot synthesize this from top down. What we do is we synthesize USB separately, we synthesize CPU separately, we synthesize impact decoder separately, and then we do top level synthesis. So, at a USB level or a CPU level or an impact decoder level, it is a top down thing. But at a chip level, it is bottom up synthesis, meaning that USB is synthesized already, CPU synthesized already, impact decoder is synthesized already. We just read in the, these networks at the top level and do a top level compile, assuming that a top level will have some blue logic in our case. So, Similarly, you could also have a mix level compile where we take the advantages of both top down and bottom up. So, use top down for small block, use bottom up to tie small hierarchies into larger block. This is one example. Uh, for example, a bottom up compile can be used for B. Uh, and A, B, C, and D are all bottom up compiled, for example. Uh, that means A is compiled. Separately, B is compiled separately, C is compiled separately, D is compiled separately. But we define timing budgets for A, B, C, and D so that the top level can be read in after reading the netlist for A, B, C, and D. So, if you look from the top, it is bottom up. If you look from the A level of B, it is top down. So, these are just uh, some terms. So, always, it is always almost always a mixed level strategy for this level. But for your block, Practically, please use the recommendation is to use top down. Now, let us look at uh, what happens when you have multiple instances in your design. So, in a hierarchical design, often there are multiple instances of same model. For example, in this top design, U3 and U4 both belong to the model C. So, there are two instances of C. One is U3, other is U4. So, what are the loaded designs in memory? A instance U1, C instance U3, U4, D instance U5, and B instance U2. How do we resolve this? Now, the first thing you should understand is that although U3 and U4 they belong to the same module C. The environment conditions of U3 and U4 are different. 
by here u4 might talk to u5 and might talk to u1. This u3 might talk to only u4 alone. So, although the module level remains soon, the description remains soon, let us say you have an adder design, let us say you have a new design, new design and 8 bit adder. Now, this 8 bit adder, although it has the same module, you might have multiple instances of the same bit adder. One of the adder might work at a lower frequency, other adder might work at a higher frequency. What it means? It means that although the logical, at the logical level, both of them are same. But when it will come to implementation, one adder will be completely different from other. So, how does DC resolve it by default, or what other steps can we take to resolve such things? So, first is the unit to find method. This is the simplest of the method in which the tool is automatic. So, that the process of unit to find means that each of the copy of the module. So, there are multiple instances, each copy is a unique copy. DC will assume each copy is a unique copy. So, it will do something which is called unique Let us see, we will see it in detail what it means. Second process which we could use is the compile one stone touch method. We will see what it means. Third is the ungroup method. Let us see in detail. So, now in, in case of unit profile, what DC will assume as soon as it sees U3 and U4 belonging to the same module C. It will make two different copies. It will copy C into C0 and C1 and it will remove C. Now, for all practical purposes, what DC did is create separate unique designs. Now, this design top does not have any multiple instances. This process is automatic as soon as you do a compile command, as soon as you do a compile command. DC will start looking for multiple instances, it will start applying unit to this. This will remove the original design from memory after it creates a new unit design. Uh, this you can only stop this by setting a don't touch command on some design. If the design is don't touch, if you, if you use a command called set don't touch on a particular design, DC will not do anything about the design. So, uh, this is again an automatic process and it is the most desirable process in the sense that you should use this uh, use this default thing uh, in most of the cases. There are very special cases in which you will use any of these two other techniques, but this is the most famous technique and it is, it is recommended that you use it almost always. The second is compile once do not method. So, uh, what it means is that we compile once that means let us say a design C has three copies. We compile C separately, separately not as part of the top design. We compile C separately and then read this netlist, read this, read this compiled netlist as part of the top level design. And since this C is already <laughs> mapped, we set a don't test on it. So now DC will not do since we have said don't touch on this, DC will not do anything to it. So we should only do this if the environment around the instances are sufficiently similar. That means all the designs, all the copies of that, all the instances of that design should work on similar frequency or almost same frequency. And even the environment conditions, even the input output code specifications are similar. Otherwise, you will see violation in one instance and not see any violation in the other instance. Now, let us say you have an 8 bit adder again, one works at 100 megahertz, another works at 200 megahertz. If you use this approach, then first question is you have to. Since you have to synthesize this adder separately, what frequency would you do? Common sense would tell you use 200 megahertz. Why? Because a 200 megahertz implementation will work for 100 megahertz. But now a 200 megahertz will have more area than 100 megahertz. So, in this case, it is not desirable to use the approach. It is desirable to use the unit to But if both the adders work at 100 megahertz, you could use this approach. Now, uh, 
in this method we compile the design using the environment of one of the instances and then use the send code set don't touch command. So these are the steps we characterize the set design instance we should use the characterize command as a second step as a second iteration just like we did it for bottom up it is the same case we compile the reference set design we set don't touch command on these and compile the entire design for example let us see we set the current design to be top we characterize u2 u3 that means u2 slash u3 is this design. So, we will characterize only one of this, this only one of C3 or C4. We need to characterize only one. So, we characterize U3. We set the current design to be C. We did a compile. Obviously, one thing is missing here in this script is the reading this constraint. So, we characterize U3, read in the constraint for U3, compile, compile U3. Again, we set the current design to be top and then set do not touch on U3 and U4. U3 and U4, and then we again compile the top level. It might seem a bit confusing at first, but uh, the essence is that one of the sub designs we have already compiled, and you do not want DC to touch it further to modify it further as, as, part, as part of the top level. Design. This method, in essence, is very similar to the bottom up compiler. If you compare these scripts. They are almost same. You use the characterize command, you use the write script command, you compile a sub design, and then you set don't touch on the sub design. So, set don't touch part is the only unique part here. Third is the ungroup method. This <laughs> method is, uh, is the same as unicify method almost, but it will remove the level of hierarchy. So, this actually ungroup command is. Uh, not tied to the unification process that means ungroup command you can use it to remove the hierarchy at any part of the design. So, here what we do is we remove this hierarchy that is earlier the design was this you had u3, u4, u5. Now, what we could do is we could ungroup u3 and u4 what it means is that the hierarchy u3 and u4 will be removed. Now, if u3 and u4 is removed all these cells are part of the the design is automatically unified because now the module C does not exist the design C does not exist the module boundary C is dissolved that is what ungroup does even you could ungroup U5 if you want you can ungroup U5 ungroup is not tied to the unification process. So, by doing ungroup in this particular specific example we are unifying the design explicitly. So, uh, this is one, one other way of doing that, but again so ungroup has one more advantage is that when you ungroup the design now DC can combine the combination elements of both U3 and U4 and optimize it more effectively. So, obviously the more hierarchy the design has the more artificial boundaries it has and the more it will prevent DC to optimize the design further that is why we say that the design should be logically partitioned in such a manner that it helps be seen optimizing the design and not the other way around. So, we, we saw we saw uh, one example at how to logically partition the design, how to keep the combination logic and the related sequential logic together in the, in the same module. We have already seen that in one of the lectures, we we'll go back and revise that. So, so we saw three commands, uh, we saw we saw three. Uh, methods of resolving multiple instances unicify, compile one stone touch, ungroup. I would again recommend to use unicify that is the, the default, you do not have to specify any separate command, the compile command itself will do it for you. Now, let us look at the compile command. Compile command has these many options no map and all that. I would recommend that you go, go to the Dixie shell and read the man page. I would discuss the most famous options that are part of the compile command. So, one is the compile effort, this is the map effort, this is called the compile effort. The default option is medium, uh, design compiler will find a good mapping, uh, but it will not use some of the CPU intensive strategies. So, it is uh, medium is uh, appropriate for getting a quick idea of your area and timing. 
it is it should be used for most cases let's say if you feel that you have you are still left with some volume or you feel that you should, you should get a lower area still you can use a math effort high please note by using math effort high the run times will increase they might increase significantly for bigger to so uh, it will use some of the strategies that it did not use in the medium so this this part is used for some critical design right? other is the incremental compile in the incremental compile test we see that incremental compile is usually the second pass onwards that means at first you should run without the incremental compile option that is the whole compile process should, should take place take place and then let's say now uh, after the increment after the compile is done the full compile is done now you want to feel you want to think that okay now uh, i feel that one of the input delays is uh, is slightly low i want to increase the input delay you can do that and then do an incremental compile what this will do is incremental compile the portions of a design that are already mapped are exempt from logic level optimization but it will use a new constraint new input delay constraint to fix any timing volition it will try to fix any timing volition that might arise out of changing a small constraint let's say changing an input delay or output delay and the resulting design will be either same if no improvements can be made or slightly better in terms of design volition there are some cases where design volition operators are reflected also Uh, so uh, such a swap if if that swap can improve the optimization part based based on the constraints so incrementally compile is just to see if you made small changes to your constraint you can use this minus incrementally compile option to quickly get an improved at least if possible so uh, some figures uh, in let's say for a design it takes 8 hours to do a full compile it might take just one hour to do an incremental compile please do not think that uh, let's say if you want to increase the clock frequency now increasing the clock frequency is not a small change it's a big thing so in such cases i would recommend go for a full compile but for small changes such, such as changing the input delay a bit or changing the driving cell of some input a bit or changing the load on the output port uh, you can use incremental compile there is one option called boundary optimization Uh, if you enable the boundary optimization, DC will optimize across half of the boundary. This means that a module function in RTL, so the the design implementation of a module could now be different from its RTL description of a set design on the top level design. So uh, in most of the cases where boundary optimization is enabled, it might happen that input or output ports are complemented as a result of this process and thus the design the necklace of that sub design will not be functionally equivalent to the rtl so you should use this carefully uh the if the if the output port and input ports are complemented then the port names are changed port names of the sub design not the top level design using this variable another option is scan uh, this specifies that uh, the compile command should use the scan flip flop now when you use the uh, when you do the first level of compile without scan now a, a flop a non scan flop and a flop with scan functionality has area difference the one with the scan will have a larger area somewhat larger area now a non scan design ultimately will be scanned right so for getting the complete the accurate idea of the area figures you should use this option why because in this option dc will start using the scan flip flop it will not do anything else it will just use scan flip flop it will not stitch the scan change it will not do anything else so now this necklace which has the scan flip flops will give a better idea of the area of the actual area right okay. so i am assuming that if you are not familiar with scan it would be good to read uh, some uh, basic uh, stuff on scan what are the type of scan technique on what are the basics of dft what is the difference between a scan flip flop and a normal flip flop this course does not focus on dft it will assume that you have some basic knowledge of it. 
so uh, by accounting for the uh, by accounting for the impact of internal scan function from the start uh, this uh, this step will eliminate the need for future reopening so it's a good thing to have so uh, apart from these options there are multiple options exact map and so on and so on you could read more about it there will be examples uh, so as and when we proceed in this course we will see some of the examples and then i'll explain the option this option is very important very interesting gate clock so i'll have a couple of lectures on power i'll discuss this gate clock uh, during those uh, during the, the during the power discussion so this gate clock is used to save power uh, save dynamic power we'll see how and we'll see what what this option does so uh, so this is uh, so we saw uh, the different compile strategies top down bottom up we saw how to resolve multiple instances uh, using the unit wise process or compile one send this so don't touch we saw the ungroup command then we saw the actual compile command uh, <coughs> so there are two commands as i said before compile and compile at all in this lecture we have seen the compile command in unit 4 you will see the compile ultra command you might not use compile ultra command but the compile ultra has a lot of advanced synthesis features so between unit 4 and unit 5 there are unit 3 and unit 4 just before uh, we start unit 4 i would recommend you to be comfortable with this command so you can understand the advanced features only if you understand the basic features so so this compile command has lot of basic features read about this compile command try out different variations see what each of this option does to your netlist does to your optimization read more about it and when we start unit 4 it will help you to understand the compile ultra command and some of the advanced features a lot better thank you